Hey, 42 here. Steven Spielberg's Jaws is considered by many to be one of the finest films ever made. The ferocious fish fest features many iconic moments, but Spielberg himself has a personal favorite. The scene in which grizzled shark hunter Quint recounts the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. In case you haven't seen it, Quint describes how in July 1945, hundreds of American sailors were left stranded in the chilly waters of the Pacific Ocean after their ship was sunk by a Japanese sub. I'll save the gory details for later in the video, but the last line of the infamous monologue sums things up nicely. 1,100 men went into the water, 316 men came out, and the sharks took the rest. Jaws is, for the most part, pure Hollywood nonsense, but this particular scene is based on entirely true events. The USS Indianapolis really did go down in 1945 after being torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. And thanks to a series of monumental balls ups on the part of the US Navy, it was four long days before the rescue mission was launched. Today, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis is widely considered to have been the single deadliest shark attack in history. And what those sailors went through as the sharks began to circle has become the stuff of maritime legend. But the story of this remarkable ship is about much more than its harrowing demise. Built during peacetime, the Indianapolis was the unofficial ship of state for Franklin D. Roosevelt. And when war broke out, it became the flagship of the greatest fleet ever assembled. After fighting in almost every major engagement in the Pacific theater and miraculously surviving what should have been certain destruction at the hands of Japanese kamikaze pilots, the Indianapolis was sent on one final top secret mission. One that directly contributed to the ending of the Second World War and changed our world forever in the process. This is the story of the USS Indianapolis, the most remarkable ship ever to sail the seven seas. Keeps is an online subscription service that makes it easy and affordable for men to treat their male pattern baldness. You can get expert care for hair loss from the comfort of your home without ever visiting the doctor's office or pharmacy. All treatment plans are personalized and are affordable. They're typically half the cost of traditional pharmacy prices. Keeps offers both of the FDA approved hair loss treatment options, as well as a two in one gel that combines both treatments. According to clinical studies, treatments offered by Keeps are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase hair growth by up to 35%. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has you covered. In addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps offers hair thickening, shampoo, conditioner, and a styling pomade, which I love. Most Keeps customers notice results within six months of starting a treatment. To date, Keeps has helped nearly 1 million men to keep their hair. They deliver treatments to your door in discreet packaging and shipments are every three, six or 12 months and they work to your schedule. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get you started, go to keeps.com slash 42 or just click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash 42. And a big thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this video. For a vessel that's still very much recognizable as a modern warship, it's surprising to think that construction of the USS Indianapolis began almost a century ago, way back in 1930. A Portland-class heavy cruiser, the ship was 186 meters long and weighed a staggering 10,000 tons. To put those numbers into perspective, the Indianapolis was twice as long as Big Ben is tall and weighed as much as the Eiffel Tower. Like most World War II era vessels, it was steam powered, and with an operational range of a cool 15,000 miles, the Indianapolis could sail more than halfway around the planet without stopping to refuel. Having been born into history's unofficial half time break between the two world wars, early life for the Indianapolis was relatively sedate. An early mission saw the ship take Franklin D. Roosevelt on a tour of South America, and it was during that trip that the president had his crossing the line ceremony. In case you aren't familiar, crossing the line is a tradition in many navies that marks the first time a rookie sailor crosses the equator at sea. From what I can gather, it's mostly an excuse for hundreds of men to dress up in drag and physically assault each other with seawater. Hey, whatever floats your 10,000 ton boat. 
A key feature of many crossing the line ceremonies is a trial, in which initiates are made to prove their seaworthiness before a mock court. Apparently, not even Roosevelt, the most powerful man on the planet at the time, was exempt. Here you can see him aboard the Indianapolis pleading his case before the royal judge of King Neptune's court. Oh, no, wait, that's just some bloke with a mop on his head. Anyway, soon enough, the wigs and lipstick had to go back into the Indianapolis' dressing up box because across the Atlantic, a monumental arsehole named Adolf was busy trying to burn the entire world down. Before the US entered the war, the Indianapolis was stationed at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Yeah, that Pearl Harbor. But as luck would have it, on the day of the infamous Japanese attack, the Indianapolis was bombing the crap out of an empty island 800 miles away as part of a training exercise. Just over 24 hours after the Japanese poked the Pearl Harbor bear, uh, the US officially entered the war. And over the following four years, the Indianapolis fought in almost every major engagement in the Pacific theater, earning 10 battle stars in the process. For much of that time, it served as the flagship of the most powerful fleet ever assembled, the US Navy's Fifth Fleet, under Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance. By all accounts, the Indianapolis was well on its way to becoming one of the most highly decorated American warships of all time. But on the 31st of March, 1945, a run-in with a Japanese kamikaze plane changed everything. The Indianapolis had been bombarding beach defenses at Okinawa in preparation for a US invasion, when a kamikaze plane appeared as if from nowhere, diving straight for the ship. It's estimated the Indianapolis' gunners had just 15 seconds to react, but these men were the best of the best, and they managed to strike the plane with a glancing blow, knocking it off course to crash harmlessly into the ocean nearby. That was the good news. The bad news was that in the final seconds of his life, the Japanese pilot released the single giant bomb that his plane was carrying. It was dropped at an altitude of just 7.5 meters. So close, it simply couldn't miss. As it happens, it was actually a little bit too close. The bomb did indeed find its target, smashing directly into the deck of the Indianapolis. The trouble was, it kept on going, smashing through the mess hall and fuel tanks before punching an exit wound in the bottom of the ship and detonating in the water below. Had that bomb exploded a second or two earlier, it would have been curtains for the USS Indianapolis, and this video almost certainly wouldn't exist. But the ship survived, just about. The damage was substantial, and the Indianapolis was forced to limp back to the naval shipyard at Mare Island for emergency repairs. As fate would have it, that put it in exactly the right place, at exactly the right time, to be assigned one of the most important naval missions, not just of the Second World War, but of all time. Over the previous three years, a group of rather clever scientist types have been busy inventing what remains, to this day, the most destructive weapon ever conceived by man. The atomic bomb. By the summer of 1945, the Manhattan Project was almost ready to unleash this new form of devastation on Japan in hopes of ending the war for good. Two bombs were already ready to go, Little Boy and Fat Man, but both had been built at Los Alamos in New Mexico. If they were to be dropped on Japan as plans, they first needed to get them there, and that wasn't as straightforward as it might sound. These were highly experimental weapons. The firing mechanism in Little Boy had never even been tested. Premature detonation of these city-killing bombs was a genuine concern. To be on the safe side, the WMDs were ships dismantled, with some parts going by air and others by sea. As the biggest, fastest and downright meanest ship in the area at the time, the Indianapolis was entrusted with, amongst other things, Little Boy's most important component, the enriched uranium core. It's hard to overstate just how important this cargo was, if you've seen the recent Oppenheimer film, you'll know that one of the biggest challenges the Manhattan Project faced was enriching enough uranium to make a viable bomb. That was the whole marbles in the fishbowl business. The fate of the world hung on every single kilogram of fissile material. And yet, when the USS Indianapolis set out from Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco, with the components for Little Boy stored safely inside, 
it was carrying roughly half the world's total supply of enriched uranium. The priceless cargo was so classified, even the ship's captain had no idea what he was carrying. The Indianapolis departed Hunter's Point just three hours after the first ever successful detonation of an atomic bomb in the now famous Trinity Test. As soon as they know the bombs were viable, they were on their way to the Tinian Islands 1,500 miles south of Japan. The Indianapolis made this 6,000 mile journey across almost the entire Pacific Ocean in just 10 days. The rest, as they say, is history. On the 6th of August 1945, Little Boy was loaded into the belly of a Boeing B-29 Superfortress called the Enola Gay and dropped on the city of Hiroshima. Three days later, Fat Man was detonated over Nagasaki, and six days after that, Emperor Hirohito announced the surrender of Japan to the Allies. For most people, it was a day of huge celebration, but not for the crew of the Indianapolis, because by the official end of the war, most of them were already dead. After delivering its deadly cargo to Tinian Island, the Indianapolis was sent first to Guam and then on to the Philippines. But whilst on the way to the island of Leyte just after midnight on the 30th of July, the ship was sighted by the I-58, a Japanese submarine. Under cover of darkness, the sub carefully maneuvered into the perfect firing position, then loosed six torpedoes towards its oblivious target, Two struck home, and the damage was catastrophic, near enough tearing the ship in two. Twelve minutes later, the mighty USS Indianapolis was gone, swallowed by the inky waters of the Pacific Ocean. It happened so fast, approximately 300 of the close to 1,200 men on board went down with the ship. The rest were pitched into the endless expanse of the Pacific Ocean. A few made it into lifeboats, but the vast majority were simply cast adrift in the water with only basic life jackets to keep them afloat. Alone in the darkness, the terrified men, many of whom were badly injured from explosions aboard the ship, could do nothing but wait to be saved. Unfortunately, rescue was very much not on the way. At its height, the US Navy fielded a whopping 7,000 ships during the Second World War. Coordinating such a vast fleet was a monumental task, and certain corners were cut just to make the whole thing feasible. In January 1945, a Pacific Fleet Directive was issued, stating that the arrival of large combat ships no longer needed to be reported centrally. Unfortunately, a rather creative port official at Leyte decided the new directive meant he didn't need to report non-arrivals either, which meant that when the Indianapolis failed to turn up as scheduled, nobody raised the alarm. That was a huge oversight, but were it not for another major balls up, it shouldn't have mattered. After the torpedoes hit home, the Indianapolis followed standard protocols and immediately sent out distress signals calling for aid. But the ship's radio equipment had been damaged in the attack and those signals were never transmitted. Or at least, that's what everyone believed for more than 40 years. But documents declassified in 1999 showed that those distress signals were picked up by no fewer than three different radio operators, all of whom attempted to pass the vital information up the chain of command. Remarkably, all three were ignored. One of their commanding officers was drunk, one had done the military equivalent of hangar do not disturb sign on his door, and the other believed the transmission to be a Japanese ruse. All of which meant that approximately 900 sailors who'd survived the sinking of the Indianapolis were on their own in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 600 miles from the nearest significant land. The first sharks were spotted as the sun rose that very morning. And the following four days were punctuated with blood-curdling screams as the crew of the Indianapolis were picked off one by one by circling oceanic white tips and tiger sharks. It's hard to imagine just how terrifying it must have been to be hunted by five-meter sharks out in the open ocean. 
but the sad truth is there is a lot more to worry about than just the utterly terrifying local wildlife. This was the height of summer in the Western Pacific, just 12 degrees north of the equator. Daytime temperatures were pushing 40 degrees Celsius, and the light from the sun reflecting off the water rendered the men near blind during the day. And the nights weren't any better, with water temperatures cold enough to induce hypothermia. There was almost nothing to eat or drink, and as severe dehydration started to set in, many eventually gave in and just drank seawater, which only served to speed up their demise. One of the symptoms of extreme dehydration is delirium, and as the days wore on, many of the survivors began to literally lose their minds, suffering vivid hallucinations and in some cases attacking or even drowning one another. And what little remained developed brutal salt water ulcers that soon became infected. Put simply, for four full days, these men experienced conditions that were right on the very brink of what the human body can endure. And through it all, there were the sharks, always circling. In truth, nobody knows how many men were taken by the tigers and white tips that flocked to the site of the sinking in their hundreds. Conservative estimates put the number at around 30, but some people believe it may have been upwards of 150. Perhaps it's for the best that we'll never know for certain. By this point, you might be starting to wonder how we even know about all of this. I mean, surely nobody survived this living hell, right? Well, were it not for a huge stroke of good fortune, they almost certainly wouldn't have. But on the morning of the 2nd of August, three and a half days after the Indianapolis was lost, a US spotter plane on a routine patrol hunting Japanese subs saw a large oil slick spread out across the ocean and what looked like men in the water within it. The crew reported their findings to shore, and a few hours later, a seaplane piloted by Lieutenant Adrian Marks arrived at the scene to investigate further. Marks brought his Catalina flying boat in low to get a better look, and what he saw would haunt him for the rest of his days. Hundreds of American sailors in the water, a few in lifeboats, most floating in what were essentially human rafts. All were clearly on the brink of death. Marks reported the situation at once, and finally realizing that their 10,000 ton, $10 million warship had sunk four days ago without anyone noticing, the US Navy launched an immediate large-scale rescue effort. Having successfully completed his mission, Lieutenant Marks should simply have returned to base. But he didn't. His plane was capable of landing on water, but there was a strict standing order in place never to land on the open ocean. The large swells made it far too dangerous. Still, Marks knew it would take some time for the ship-based cavalry to show up, and if there was one thing those men in the water did not have, it was more time. Even from the air, he could see dozens, if not hundreds of corpses floating amongst the living, not to mention the ever-circling sharks and the blooms of red in the water that marked the places they'd already struck. And so, Marks asked his crew to take a vote. Either head back to base, or break the standing order and attempt to land the aircraft. To a man, they voted for the latter. Marks brought the plane down safely, but it was a close run thing, with the aircraft bouncing precariously off a three and a half meter wave before settling unsteadily in the water. Marks and his crew began taxiing around amongst the survivors, pulling those in the worst condition into the plane. When there was no more space inside, the crew used parachute cord to lash as many men as they could to the wings. That night, the rescue ships began to arrive and the remaining survivors were pulled from the water along with the mutilated bodies of their fallen comrades. 1,195 men had been on board the Indianapolis when the torpedo struck. Just 316 survived. Of that number, 56 were directly saved by Adrian Marks and his crew. That risky landing in the open ocean had rendered their plane unflyable. And once all the survivors had been pulled from the water, one of the rescue ships, the USS Cecil J. Doyle, sank it with a volley from its guns. Rather than receive punishment for breaking a standing order, Marx was given the Air Medal, 
which is awarded for acts of heroism during aerial missions. Amongst the survivors of the Indianapolis tragedy was the ship's captain, Charles McVeigh III, but in the aftermath of the rescue, he was court-martialed on charges of putting his ship and crew in danger by failing to zigzag, a routine tactic used to confuse enemy subs in hostile waters. McVeigh was convicted, and the decision ultimately left his career and reputation in tatters. He never truly recovered, and in 1968, he took his life. The US Navy lost almost 400 ships during the Second World War, but McVeigh was the only captain to be court-martialed for the loss of his ship due to enemy action. While some of the survivors and relatives of those who died blamed McVeigh for his role in the tragedy, the vast majority felt that he'd been made a scapegoat. And almost 30 years after his death, that viewpoint was proven to be accurate. By a sixth grader, Hunter Scott was inspired to study the sinking of the Indianapolis after learning about the story from our old mate Quint whilst watching Jaws. Showing a frankly unsettling level of dedication and skill for a 12-year-old, Hunter pulled together an impressive body of evidence, suggesting that McVeigh had indeed been treated unfairly. For example, whilst it's true that the Indianapolis hadn't been zigzagging when it was sunk, it turned out McVeigh's superiors had failed to mention to him that Japanese subs were known to be active along his route at the time, and zigzagging was only required in hostile waters. It also transpired that McVeigh had requested a destroyer escort for the journey, especially one with submarine detection equipment, something the Indianapolis lacked. But that request was denied. Supported by many Indianapolis survivors, Scott eventually took this evidence and more before Congress, and in the year 2000, President Bill Clinton himself exonerated Captain McVeigh. The Indianapolis went down in some of the deepest waters on Earth, not too far from the Mariana Trench. And until recently, nobody knew exactly where the wreck had ended up. Multiple expeditions have tried and failed to find the Indianapolis over the years, but it wasn't until 2017 that a civilian team, funded by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, uncovered the final resting place of the now legendary ship three and a half miles beneath the surface of the Pacific Ocean. The story of the USS Indianapolis is one of both bravery and tragedy, but it's also one of hope. As of the recording of this video, precisely one survivor of the sinking is still alive, veteran Harold Bray. In mid-2023, Harold wrote a letter to a Japanese man he'd never met before, Konshiro Kiyozimi, the last surviving crew member of the Japanese submarine I-58. These two men had been sworn enemies on opposite sides of a colossal tragedy, but Bray's letter wasn't one of hate. It was full of forgiveness, friendship, and thanks. A few weeks later, Konshiro Kiyozumi sent Harold an equally heartwarming reply. A reminder that even in times of unprecedented political division, we can all find common ground as fellow humans. Thanks for watching. Just a quick word to say that I couldn't make these videos without the support of my Patreon members. Consider joining the exclusive 42 Discord community by supporting me on Patreon. It's a great place to discuss my videos with like-minded individuals and myself. The link's in the description, but if you don't want to, or you can't join my Patreon, then please don't worry. A simple like or comment to say thanks would also put a huge smile on my face. Thank you.